Today we're going to be in conversation about the making of the U.S. Constitution back in 1787 at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. My guest today argues that this document, which is largely revered in public discourse today, is a document, however, that was made by the elites, meant to serve the elites, and it's a document that has served the elites in this country ever since. My guest is Robert Ovitz. Robert Ovitz is a senior lecturer in political science and public administration at San Jose State University, and he is the author of the book that he joins us to talk about called We the Elites, Why the U.S. Constitution Serves the Few. Robert Ovitz, it's a great pleasure to welcome you back to this radio program. It's always nice to be talking with you, Mitch. Thanks for having me. Let's talk about some terms as we begin here. And you break this down right at the beginning of your book, the differences between a democracy and a republic. Talk to me about both of these. What is a democracy? What is a republic? And compare and contrast them for me. Well, I think that's a something that we often don't really fully understand. And essentially, a democracy is based on the Greek word of the demos, demos, and crassi, so a system run by and for the people. And that word originates during the ancient Athenian period for about 200 years when the the ordinary people of Athens, uh, then a city-state, um, was uh, were involved in governing themselves. They had an assembly and every free adult male, regardless of how much property or their status that they had, were obligated to participate in the assembly and they each took turns from from local districts. Uh, compare that to the the Roman system based on the Senate uh, for about 500 years where the landed elite, essentially sent their family member to serve in the Senate. Um, there was a tribune, which was popularly elected by those who were eligible to participate, uh, but all of its decisions could be checked by the Senate. And the Senate formed the executive branch. Uh, they picked two uh, senators to serve as proconsuls, and they took turns and had term limits. Um, and then... Uh, that ultimately descends into uh, an empire and dictatorship. So we get the word republic from the Roman system. And when we define a republic, we essentially mean a system in which there is no monarch and in which there are representatives, but they're effectively, they don't have to be elected. Uh, they could be self-appointed and they don't operate according to democratic rules and procedures. We, we have, have a republic. republic. We originally had a republic with some democratic elements, and what the framers formed essentially was uh, a republic uh, modeled in part after Rome. They preferred Rome over Athens. They didn't trust the everyday people to have political power, to have their hands on the lever of power. Um, so they limited it, and they limited the only democratic representation to the House of Representatives, which is problematic in itself, and I can talk about that as well. Um, and then the rest were essentially appointed or indirectly elected through the Electoral College or through having our um, Senate be uh, picked by the state legislatures. So the way I try to think about it is that the framers established a republic with some flavor of democratic aspects. And then over time, because people resisted that original model, protested against it. Um, they we start to reform the system to expand suffrage, but we haven't transformed the other two branches, which are not elected. Ancient history here is not insignificant. If you go back and you read about the debates or the Federalist Papers or what is available, a lot of what actually happened in the convention itself, we, 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 there's still a lot we don't know because you weren't even allowed to take notes during the convention. But ancient history is important because if you go back and read what is available about this period of time, it does read as though they are debating ancient history about what happened in Athens and Rome. Well, absolutely. And, you know, one thing I love about listening to your show is that you love to get back into that history. And it's that history that really motivated me to write this book. I've been teaching thousands of undergraduates an introductory level course to U.S. and California government and politics. And I decided I wanted to go back and learn about what the framers really thought and who they were. 
And I read uh, the uh, limited amounts of notes that um, some of the framers and then a secretary who was hired to take notes at the convention, what existing record of those notes are. Most of what we know about what comes from the convention actually comes from Madison's notes, who he wasn't allowed to, to take notes and take them out, um, but he did. And they were the most thorough um, but he revised them and, in a way, rewrote history of what really happened in some ways. And there's historians that have uh, demonstrated uh, the history that he changed to make himself look better decades later. And that was published uh, shortly after he died. He revised it late in his life. So we have actually very little information about what really happened inside the convention. Um, we do also have other uh, sources of information, um, including letters, um, the transcripts of the debates from the state ratifying conventions. We have, of course, the famous Federalist Papers. A lot of people don't realize also that there were also many more anti-Federalist Papers that were written, um, and they had much more. They had much less circulation because of the mass censorship that was going on, trying to block them from organizing and publishing their ideas and critiques of the Constitution. Um, and we also have various pamphlets and um, and then uh, notes that people had written down that were never published anywhere and came out because historians scoured the records. And those are the things that I use primarily to understand the kind of constitution that the framers were designing. Um, and I think that the, that source material really gives us a very different picture. And I wanted to make it available to the general reader because most historians and political scientists are aware that the framers were no big fan of what I like to say is Athens. They were much more, um, much more enamored by Rome. Um, most of the American population has it backwards. And so I'm trying to correct that. Understand. Tell, tell me more about the Anti-Federalists and did they inform your, your critique of, of the Constitution? Well, the Anti-Federalists uh, were a wide variety. They were a coalition. They were a wide variety of people in the country at the time. Um, the backbone of the Anti-Federalists were the small subsistence farmers who um, had a very cogent critique of elite rule in their own states and also across the different states. Because remember, at the time of the convention, we had a confederation of 13 states, and there was also Vermont, but it wasn't considered uh, part of the confederation. And so there were all types of struggles that were going on between uh, a small proportion of the population that were skilled workers, uh, small merchants, subsistence farmers. They sometimes got along with each other. And then also the big bankers, the slave owners, the, the traders, the investors, and so forth. Um, and so the Anti-Federalists were made up really out of a coalition of those groups. The backbone were the subsistence farmers who had been in numerous uh, insurrectionary revolts and had formed alternative political parties, which were quite successful in some of the states. And there were a few elites who actually uh, were on uh, were active members of the Anti-Federalists. Uh, but overall, the Anti-Federalists were a lot poorer than the so-called Federalists. Um, the Anti-Federalists uh, published their their Anti-Federalist papers in a limited number of newspapers. And so we, we know the names of most of them. Uh, unfortunately, if you go online right now and Google Anti-Federalists, you will not find a free copy of the entire Anti-Federalist papers. And I, I referenced this in the introduction because essentially there's been a kind of academic censorship of the Anti-Federalists. Whereas Federalist Papers, you can find complete copies on several websites. You can buy them at you know half price books in uh, Green Apple Books. Uh, but the Anti-Federalists are a lot harder to find. And the Anti-Federalists had a number of really important critiques that are very relevant for us today. Uh, they had an overarching critique of elite rule. They, con they were concerned that the Constitution, which they couldn't read until it had been issued. So many of the Federalists obviously really knew what it said already because 55 of them were already at the convention um, and had been writing their friends about it. Um, but they had also critiqued things like the judicial branch supposedly being appointed for life. And I put air quotes around that. Um, they had critiqued the way that the president and the vice president were indirectly elected. All of the critiques that we have today, two houses of the legislature, uh, 
um, the protections for various forms of property, including slavery and, and including creditors' interests. Um, the anti-federalist papers are kind of a mixed bag. Some of them have a, a kind of um, not precise analysis because they were rushing to try to talk about the Constitution when they hadn't really had time to fully analyze the Constitution. Um, but I find that many of their letters and the debates in the state ratifying conventions were actually uh, quite cogent and they were quite successful in some of the states in almost uh, stopping the Constitution from being ratified. It was close, the, the final the ratification tally. I don't know if it was close, but the first four states ratified pretty quickly with almost no opposition. And that was done really in the middle of winter. Um, but once the anti-federalists really kind of got together and they created a network of people across the different states, they really started to mobilize and they were able to win a few votes um, in some important states. But ultimately, there was arm twisting. There was bribery, outright bribery. Uh, they got some uh, leaders to flip sides um, and then um, it squeaked by. It, it took it took over a year, but um, except Rhode Island held out for several years. And that's that's a fascinating story. Most people don't really know. But um, it got it got close for a while. Um, but in the end, uh, the anti-federalists were outmaneuvered. Um, they were essentially outspent, if you will. There were m much more resources available to the Federals because they were just overall wealthier. What was fascinating about Rhode Island? Well, Rhode Island did not even send delegates to the convention. Um, as uh, one of the leaders of, of the, um, you could say, the political elite of Rhode Island at the time, um, essentially said, you know, we, we don't trust this process. Um, and so they never voted to send delegates. And then after the Constitution went out for ratification, um, Rhode Island uh, voted it down numerous times. And it took several years before it finally voted to ratify the Constitution and join as a state. And most people don't really know how that vote actually came about. Um, there was a friend of Hamilton's uh, who was a prominent Federalist in Rhode Island, um, who had been appointed uh, to a pretty prominent position uh, in the Washington administration, low level, but prominent. And uh, so he um, he had um, really kind of organized an opposition and there were threats from the Washington administration to um, to uh, essentially invade Rhode Island um, to collect the debts that it still owed uh, from the revolutionary and, uh, war era and the and during the period of the uh, Confederation. Debt is an important part of this story leading into the Constitution. Tell me about what's happening in the years following the Revolutionary War of 1776 and perhaps tell me about the influence of what was known as Shays rebellion in Massachusetts? Well, that actually plays a huge role in the design of the Constitution in several different ways. Uh, the first is that most of the elites at the time uh, were creditors, and many of them also, and this is a story we know well with Donald Trump today, uh, they were also uh, debtors. Uh, they had borrowed money to invest. Um, they had loaned money to others. So it was a complex web of debt. During the American Revolution, the Congress essentially was broke. It couldn't issue. Um, it didn't have any gold or silver. Um, so it couldn't really coin enough money. And there was a shortage of money. And so the Congress and all the states started to issue their own paper currencies. Uh, so there were multiple different currencies, different issues of currencies. There were also different kinds of IOUs, if you will, where the revolutionary armies, as they moved around, they needed supplies and very little was actually coming from the Congress. So they would essentially take what they needed. Essentially, they would pillage. Uh, sometimes it was cooperative. Sometimes they just took it and they would write out IOUs. Uh, soldiers were paid in script. Uh, so there were a lot of different forms of, you could say, uh, currency and debt floating around. Plus, let's remember also that the Congress was borrowing lots of money to finance the revolution from France, uh, less from uh, the Netherlands, and then uh, less from Spain. 
And uh, Robert Morris, who was the head of uh, the Financial Committee of Congress at the time, became a kind of uh, fiscal dictator, if you will. Uh, one historian referred him to him in that way. And uh, he managed this complex web of debt um, and profited very, very handily from it, um, immensely so. Um, and that's a fascinating story in itself. He was later investigated by Congress and um, and owed money to the Congress. Um, ended up most of the end of his life in a debtor's prison, uh, along with Supreme Court Justice James Wilson, um, a fellow Federalist. Um, but uh, the states were also deeply in debt, issuing paper money. Uh, and so at various points, the Congress is asking the states to contribute to funding of the revolution. And most of the states are making their contributions. Um, these were called requisitions. And um, they uh, some of them fell behind. And then when the revolution ends, uh, the states um, some the, many of the states just stop sending their money. A few of the states, however, are uh, issuing really onerous taxes in order to collect uh, money in silver and gold. And um, some of the states are um, also making paper money uh, legal tender, which allows for it to be used to pay off debts, even if those debts were originally accumulated by borrowing in gold and silver. So you have this complex web of unpaid debts and you have small farmers and wealthy uh, uh, merchants and traders and slave owners that are all part of this complex web of debt. Now, the folks that are mostly out of it are the majority of the population, the subsistence farmers. Um, they operate primarily in a kind of bartering system. Um, those who are closer to the cities and the coasts are uh, more tied into the to the cash economy of the time. Um, but the subsistence farmers grow what they eat and eat what they grow and trade the rest. And so at, after the revolution ends, um, in Massachusetts, the state is controlled by uh, a pretty conservative faction, a pretty conservative party of elites, and they issue these onerous taxes and uh, revolutionary war veterans are called together um, who are unpaid. They still haven't been paid. They're called together to protest against the foreclosure of their farms for debts that they can't pay. They have no cash. Um, inflation is super high. Uh, hot, much worse than it is now. There's a shortage of cold, hard cash, really, in circulation. Uh, and they're not allowed to pay these uh, taxes uh, issued by the states in paper money or in barter anymore. And uh, so they, they form together and they shut down some court proceedings. And uh, they're really called together and organized by three people. One of them was a man by the name of, of Captain Daniel Shays. So we refer to it as the Shays Rebellion, but really it was at the time called the Regulator Rebellion. There had been several of these over the decades. And eventually they are uh, met by um, a group of mercenaries who are essentially hired by um, the governor and the elites of the state because they don't really have uh, a militia anymore. The revolution's over and uh, a brief battle occurs uh, some of the regulators are uh, killed, and then they break up and become a kind of guerrilla army carrying out various attacks on on courthouses and um, local politicians uh, across several states. And this spreads into several states at the time. And this is meant so, to stop foreclosures? This is meant to stop foreclosures and stop these onerous taxes that they can't pay with paper money. Um and several of the states at this time had uh, allowed paper money to be used to pay off taxes and debts. And that's how they got the paper money out of circulation. You could use it to pay your taxes and then they, would, they wouldn't they would reissue it. And some of the states paid off their debts this way. So uh, when the Shays Rebellion occurs, um, there's already been an effort underway to try to uh, bring some of the elites together uh, to make changes to the Articles of Confederation because Congress can't tax. So Congress is completely dependent on the states to send them that sh their share of the money. And this project actually was begun by Alexander Hamilton about a decade earlier. And uh, it starts to result in, in various meetings, um, but they're, they're 
very poorly attended. But when the Shays Rebellion happens, this becomes a motivation to call for a meeting in Philadelphia. And after a long struggle, Congress finally approves uh, calling this meeting. And they say this meeting should only be for the purpose of amending the articles. Uh, but after a couple of days, they completely throw out the articles and start all over again and write a new constitution. And so um, at the heart of the constitution is protection for property. A lot of Americans think that the constitution was written to extend rights to people. But the reality is that when the framers meet in Philadelphia, they're concerned primarily, and Madison puts this very well in his famous Federalist Number 10, with the protection of the acquisition and accumulation of property. And the primary forms of property that we really aren't fully aware of today is that that was slaves, debt, and land. Those Slavery was the most important part of the economy and the most valuable human beings were the most valuable form of property. But following closely behind were debts that had not been paid and land. When you say land, you're not talking about the, the small farmer's land. No, I'm talking about millions of acres of land that had been stolen from the native peoples through genocidal attacks um, that um, were in dispute. Some of the states had claimed these Western lands um, and there were overlapping land companies that were funded by speculators. And even some of the framers were big investors in these land companies, including Washington and Franklin and others. And uh, these lands uh, could have been used uh, to redistribute to uh, to small farmers and landless laborers if they had wanted, um, and then use the proceeds to pay off the debts. Um, there was a lot of land, and the land really wasn't very valuable because nobody could really control it. Native Americans were still well organized in trying to protect these lands and get them back to some degree, um, and there were these overlapping disputes. Um, so the country was rich in Western lands um, that um, were really virtually um, unused because Native Americans had been driven off of a lot of them. Um, and so when they're designing the Constitution, um, they deal with this question of land. Uh, they deal with the question of debt by uh, enshrining debt in, uh, in Article 6 as the supreme law of the land. A lot of people don't realize uh, that Article 6 is uh, Section 2 is subtitled uh, about debt. Um, and they and also. And this is to counter again, we talked about Shays' Rebellion, but this is sort of a dynamic that's happening throughout the, the, the states of the uprisings concerning debt. And, and this is a response to that. Yes, absolutely. So the Shays Rebellion was not the only one. There were uh, there had been various kinds of protests, and I, I talk about many of these uh, armed insurrections, attacks on uh, state legislators, for example, uh, dealing with the question of taxes and debt. And it's ironic because we also, you know, famously learn the mythology of uh, of no taxes without representation as. Um, the, the the slogan of the American Revolution, but immediately when the revolution ends, um, there's a revolt against onerous taxes. But the revolt is not just against taxes per se. It's against taxes that are used to pay back the creditors on very, very good terms. And this is where the anti-federalist critique really came in and was so powerful. And that is that um, collecting um, this revenue to pay off the creditors was actually paying them off at the current face value of those debts. And many of the biggest creditors, much of the, the outstanding debts were actually owned by a very small number of speculators. And some of these speculators were at the convention. They were framers. Um, not as many as, as we used to think. Um, many of them owned some of the debt but uh, off, uh, most of them were actually very, they held very little um, amounts, but there were some large holders of debt. Um, and so paying off the creditors at the face value of the debt meant that they would make huge profits. And one of those folks who made uh, huge profits from this uh, was Abigail Adams, um, the first vice president's wife. She had speculated while Adams was in Europe and bought up a lot of these debts. And so, um, the small farmers revolt and then the anti-federalist critique was that 
uh, we were paying these these creditors huge profits when they had often just bought these unpaid debts for pennies on the dollar from desperate people who needed the cash uh, to survive and to pay their bills. Um, and so the markup uh, was being funded by the population paying um, paying paying them back through through taxation. Um, and so when the Constitution is designed, it's primarily designed to make sure that we can create um, a federal government that can uh, not only regulate commerce, uh, but ensure that the debts get paid. And this is something that appears, as I mentioned, in Article 6, but also in Article 1, um, and is critically important uh, to the beginnings of our government. In fact, so important that uh, when the Washington administration takes office, the first administration official to be appointed uh, before uh, the Secretary of State or the head of defense is the Secretary of the Treasury, which is Alexander Hamilton. This is Letters in Politics. We are in conversation with Robert Ovitz. Robert Ovitz is Senior Lecturer in Political Science and Public Administration at San Jose State University. He joins us for a conversation on his book called We the Elites, Why the U.S. Constitution Serves the Few. Tell me then about these 55 delegates who attend the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. Are are, are creditors um, a part of this group? Yes, absolutely. Um, as I said, many of the framers owned some of the debts. Uh, a number of them also owned uh, large expanses of land. Um, but um, a small number of them owned a substantial amount of, uh, of, of outstanding um, uh, debts. And they were anxious uh, to create a system. I, I like to think not so much to meet their own personal interests, but understood that it was necessary to create a system that would uh, restore uh, the, the credit of uh, the country, if you will, quote unquote, because under the articles, there are 13 countries and they all cooperate through the Congress under the Articles of Confederation. Um, but they want to create a, a new system of government that would ensure that um, creditors be repaid. And I tried to avoid thinking about them as being personally interested. And here's why. When you read the transcripts and all the other historical evidence, um, it's obvious that some of these folks were creditors, but they talk about it in terms of what I like to think of as their shared interests as elites. They talk about um, some of the some of the discussion is about northern creditors and merchants and southern slave owners and and plantation uh, owners and they talk about it in that way because they want to try to link the interests of having a good financial system where the federal government has the ability to raise its own revenues uh, not just to pay the debts but also to support a currency that they argue with one another would assure that uh, this federal government could fund the necessary means of protecting slavery that would mean forming an army that would be at their disposal. It means setting up a judicial system, which we virtually had none under the articles. Each state had their own uh, court system, and that was pretty much the end of the line for a court case. Um, and so these, these creditors at the convention, I think are more um, class interested than personally interested in debt. And one of those who really brings that together in the most effective way is Hamilton. And, you know, I've seen the the play Hamilton twice, and I, I really love it. I, I love the sets and the music and the dance. Um, in fact, I, I like it so much that I, I have the mixtape album um, and I, I, you know, play a song in one of my classes. But the, the play gets it wrong about Hamilton. Um, not only was he not um, an active uh, anti-slavery activists, as you hear at the end from his widow's, you know, last thoughts about him. Um, but in designing the financial system, he created a federal system of credit 
funded by tax revenues uh, and then supported by a federal currency and a banking system um, that he establishes as Secretary of the Treasury through the Congress, uh, he actually creates a system that uh, deepens and protects and helps expand slavery. And I can go into that if, if you want. Tell me. So one of the most, because slavery is the most valuable form of property in the country at the time, um, having a, a, a stable, reliable credit system is really based on the value of the assets of human beings held as slaves. And, you know, I, I tried to remind myself that slaves were people, but they were also property. And uh, the creditors uh, really relied on making sure that that system of slavery continued to exist and to expand and to grow in value. Uh, because much of that wealth that came from slavery was invested in uh, banks. And at the beginning of the country, we only have about a handful of banks. And these are set up uh, by uh, various state legislatures in uh, conjunction with prominent elites in their states. For example, Robert Morris uh, sets up uh, a bank in Philadelphia that's chartered by the state legislature. Um, and so in these banks are invested the proceeds from slavery. That becomes the means for investing in manufacturing. Um, it also becomes the means by which uh, government can now borrow. Um, and so this entire web becomes the financial and credit system. And this becomes the means for Hamilton in his numerous, extremely long and tediously written uh, treatises as Secretary of the Treasury on, uh, on trade and finance and banking. Uh, this becomes the backbone of this industrial system and financial system that we still have today. It's based on slavery. But at the same time, um, it funds a federal government that can then set up and run uh, a military to protect it and then set up and run um, a, a, a strong federal government that can um, also uh, intervene um, in other parts of the world, open up new markets, and then also protect uh, U.S. goods and trade that are uh, that are starting to move across the Atlantic. Tell me about voting in the early United States. So what a lot of Americans aren't aware is that the Constitution does not extend a right to vote. Um, among the very few rights that can be found in the articles, besides the rights for property, of which there are numerous, and most of them are um, are written using euphemistic terms dealing with slavery, uh, but the few rights that exist do not include a right to vote, but they do include um, the criteria to be able to uh, run for the House and serve in the Senate and then also run and serve as president and vice president. What they do in Article 1 is they leave um, the rules for voting and the, the rights and privileges, if you will, uh, to the states. Uh, one of the critiques of the Anti-Federalists of the, of the Constitution is that there's no Bill of Rights. Several states uh, at this time, Pennsylvania being the most prominent in Virginia, have Bills of Rights of, uh, of which they include um, the right to vote, for example. And uh, But the framers avoid that. And so by leaving it up to the states to decide, they essentially leave in place a system by which you need a certain amount of property to be able to vote and to run for office. Most states have these requirements. Some states, they're pretty low now because in those states I was talking about earlier where subsistence farmers had become an organized political party, they were able to hammer those rules down. Um, and so what that means is that in the first few federal elections, really only a few thousand people can even vote. It's a very small number of people. And this is illustrative of the kind of system that the framers designed. And it goes back to your very first question that the framers designed a republic um, in which a small number of elites were able to participate. And so the, the small numbers of people who could actually vote is illustrates that concept at work. Now, this is not popular uh, because 
many of the uh, adult white men, even with small amounts of property, are excluded from participating in this political system. And so the framers essentially say, hey, you know, we fought for consent to the governed, uh, uh, unalienable rights. Well, where are these? And over the first few decades of the country's history, uh, particularly right before Jefferson throws his hat in the ring and to run for president, we have the emergence of a protest movement, um, the first suffrage movement. And what a lot of people don't realize is that this was a suffrage movement to extend the right to vote to white men, regardless of property. Um, if I had been alive at the time, <clears throat> even though I'm a white man, um, I would not have been able to vote. In fact, I probably would have been an indentured servant. My father had come into the country as an undocumented immigrant and became naturalized. Um, but I would not have had enough wealth to vote, let alone run for office. And certainly I probably wouldn't be teaching about government and politics as well. Um, and so um, the origin of our country um, is not about the freedom to vote. Um, that is limited to a small number of people because the framers were really concerned about um, giving too much power uh, to the majority. Uh, they saw the common folks uh, by various kinds of uh, demeaning terminology. They uh, commonly refer to the everyday people as the people out of doors. In other words, these are people that got their hands and clothes dirty. They worked outside all day. They know nothing about what goes on inside the halls of government. And they can't be trusted uh, to wield the powers of government because they might make decisions like are being made in some of these states I was talking about earlier that would be unfavorable to our elite property and interests. And so they constrain essentially who can vote and by who can vote uh, means that a very small number of people actually get the rights and privileges and responsibilities uh, of the of the Constitution. So they limit uh, voting uh, to make sure that property is well protected. You mentioned Jefferson, who would become the third president of the United States. It's often been described that he ran on a populist platform towards expanding the vote for white males, uh, which was significant at, at its time. Um, this is also an extreme election, a very controversial one. This is that uh, he's running against the Federalists, the people who supported strong constitution, strong central government. Jefferson was not a part of the Constitutional Convention at the time. He was in France. Um, they, The Federalist, headed by John Adams, would outlaw uh, Republican newspapers, even uh, the party of, of, of Jeff Fersen. So it's a, an extreme moment in history. And do you think that this in Jefferson, we've had folks on this show have has been described as a demagogue at the time as well, right? So you have populist slash demagogue, these kind of issues coming up. Is is this idea of expanding uh, the vote to white males, regardless of property or wealth? Uh, a part of that dynamic of what's happening in what that election of 1800? Well, certainly, I think uh, Jefferson probably would not have been elected, although he did come from essentially the most important state in the elections, along with New York, Virginia at the time. Um, and Virginia had disproportionate influence because of the three fifths clause all the way to the Civil War. Um, but certainly what helped him uh, was that these Democratic Republican clubs had formed um, during the Washington administration um, with the grievances that I was just talking about and um, essentially forms a, a kind of grassroots uh, Democratic reform movement. Um, and, you know, to be clear, this is a reform movement that's advocating for the rights for, for white men, regardless of property. Um, but it also illustrates that from the very beginnings, um, even the rights that become included in the Bill of Rights are really paper rights. In fact, Madison referred to them um, and, and in the same way. Uh, he called them parchment rights, um, that they're, they're really pointless until they're activated. And so the Democratic Republican clubs really kind of seize upon, uh, for example, the right to assemble, to petition government with grievances because they're being prosecuted and persecuted in the Adams administration um, and becomes really the first big social movement for democratic reform. 
Now, the thing that also to keep in mind, however, is that the Democratic Republican clubs, um, and that leads to the the Democratic Republican Party, which is the backbone of the origins of the of the current Democratic Party, not the Republican Party, um, is that they advocate for uh, a state based uh, slave uh, oriented economy, um, where instead of having a national bank like the Bank of the U.S. that uh, Hamilton set up to create his his financial and credit system, uh, they want to have a state banking system. Um, so. Um, Jefferson is really not um, he he's not really the the kind of democratizing force that we tend to think he was that he supported an alternative model of uh, of state based industry but primarily uh, a slave based agricultural system. How does and does the Bill of Rights play a role in this narrative? that you tell about the making of the constitution important to note that at the convention, the original constitution itself did not include the bill of rights. Uh, that's why we call it the, the first 10 amendments. It was amendment amended to the constitution in the first session uh, of Congress after Congress was created. Um, is that significant that, that the bill of rights was not included in the original constitution that, that was ratified? Well, I actually think it's, it's significant that they eventually do, uh, put forward uh, the 12 amendments to the states in the first Congress. And we, again, we don't learn about the history of why uh, the Congress was so quick to propose these. And that was because of the anti-federalists. We really have the anti-federalists to thank for uh, the fact that we have the most important part of the Constitution. Now, keep in mind that the Bill of Rights isn't all about rights for people. There are also rights for property. There's also powers to the states under the 10th Amendment and so forth. Um, but if it wasn't for the anti-federalists um, voting down uh, the Constitution in several states that I talked about earlier, and then potentially uh, tanking the ratification of the Constitution, uh, their proposed amendments uh, at some of the state conventions uh, would not have been transformed into the Bill of Rights. But it's also important to realize that Madison really kind of went through all of those proposed amendments uh, and picked out uh, the ones that he favored and then wrote them in such a way that they could not be used to threaten property. Um, and then uh, shepherded, uh, he, he, there were a few more than the ones that were eventually passed out to the states. Um, but he shepherded those through uh, rat through the ratification process in both houses of Congress. So I, I think we actually have um, those who, who were opposed to the Constitution to thank for that because uh, they had outright dismissed uh, uh, a Bill of Rights um, in the Constitutional Convention during the short periods when it actually came up. Now time for a big question towards the end. You know, we only have 50 minutes to get into a, a very big story that you tell here. Uh, but bring it to today for me. You make the argument that it's still the Constitution that favors the elites today. How so? Well, it's very clear that for many decades, our system seems unable to function. Uh, we have growing immense wealth inequality. We have uh, unlimited growth of corporate power, uh, mass gun violence, uh, Roe was just overturned, uh, climate catastrophe continues to spiral out of control. Um, we have oppressive labor law that uh, is intended to keep workers from organizing unions, although folks at Starbucks and other places are, are, are overcoming that. Um, the question is, why do these problems continue to grow worse? Um, lack any sort of action or response from Congress. And the reality is that uh, the Constitution was designed in such a way as to put roadblocks and impediments of the way in the way of what the majority wants to have done. Each of these issues have vast majority support. Polls show the population supports action on all of these issues, and yet almost nothing happens. To understand why, uh, this is why I was motivated to write this book, we really have to look not at the partisanship or the role of 
big money and dark money in our electoral system or uh, people like uh, Senator Joe Manchin or the Senate alone and the filibuster, we have to look at the source of the problem. And that is the Constitution. The Constitution was designed to constrain democracy and prevent economic democracy. Um, and all the things we've been talking about this morning were there from the very beginning. And we're still dealing with a lot of the same issues and new ones, many new ones that could never be imagined at the end of the 18th century. But one of the geniuses of the framers was that they designed a system that would be virtually impossible to change and that would effectively prevent change unless it served the interests of the property elites. In a way, it was a kind of uh, gift to uh, future generations of the property elites, and it still serves them incredibly well. If we want to bring about change, we have to win at every step in our constitutional system of what we call checks and balances. And what that essentially means is that at any step along the way, if a minority interest is opposed to that change, they can block it from happening. We saw, for example, just a few months ago, how the, inf the Inflation Reduction Act was finally passed. Well, if we go back about 10 years, it originated as the Green New Deal, an immensely huge reform of not just politics, but our entire national economy and potentially the international economy as well to get us to begin to get us off fossil fuels. What we got in the end were subsidies for the polluters, the biggest chunk of that bill. Um, and that in itself demonstrates uh, what's wrong with our system. But it's not just that Joe Manchin stood in the way. It's that the Constitution itself gave the opportunity for those who don't want change to get in the way. You you think it was designed that way? I don't Purposely. just think it. Um, if we look at the record of the framers, they made it very clear in many places. And I quote from them uh, throughout the book um, that uh, – that it's necessary, as Madison and Hamilton both described, um, to uh, adhere to a system that they called um, divide and conquer. And I, I want to share a, a passage um, from, um, from them, um, if I can find it here. Um, Madison uh, used the Latin term divide and imperia. The repro reprobated axiom of tyranny is under certain justifications, the only policy by which a republic can be administered on just principles. And essentially what they describe in several of the Federalist Papers, uh, Hamilton does this also with the Electoral College, is they talk about how as long as we keep the population divided and as long as we have certain checks on the power of the people, of democracy, um, property will be well protected. And uh, while we put a lot of attention into Federalist Number 10, uh, written by Madison, describing uh, why the system uh, could be ensured that the turbulence of the people, so to speak, uh, could be contained in order to protect property, um, it, it's littered throughout uh, the historical record of the framers that this was their intention. Robert Ovitz has been our guest. Robert Ovitz is a senior lecturer in political science and public administration at San Jose State University. He has joined us for a conversation about his book. It's called We the Elites, Why the U.S. Constitution Serves the Few. Robert Ovitz, I've enjoyed our conversation, and I thank you very much. I have as well. Thank you for having me, Mitch.